Welcome to the Korean Now Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Nian Xing Song. Nian Xing is an assistant professor of history and an affiliated faculty in the Asian Studies program at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And importantly for today's podcast, he is also the author of the book, Making Borders in Modern East Asia, The Tumen River Demarcation, 1881 to 1919. This is one of those historical narratives that touches on significant changes in the world environment at the times in which we will be referring to. Developments in human rights, populations, migration, international law, the distinction of indigenous populations, the fight for resources, and even the emergence of the nation state itself and the idea of defined barriers, defined borders, and means of protection against external invasion. It all brings itself into those core ideas of identity and national identity, where you find yourself in the world. And that is why that border that we're going to be speaking about so much today is so important. This is the border which now demarcates North Korea and China, or in the period which we're going to be referring to mostly, Chosun Korea from Qing China. But of course, back in that period, this border was a lot more fluid, a lot more contested, and a lot more difficult to define. Now, this is one of those fascinating podcasts that I personally really enjoy. I got to dig into the deep history here. There's so much fundamental detail of old scholars from China, from Korea, from Japan, all looking into this period, all looking into this border issue, developing maps, conducting their own surveys of the area, and then building up their own legal theories, their own ideas about where the border should be and what it means for the countries involved. And of course, this means we're going to speak about not just the Tumen River, but also Mount Pektu, which is the mountain on the border, which feeds both the Tumen and Yalu rivers, and which Koreans consider to be the birth of their nation, the site of their origin story, where Tangun first emerged. But of course, as you'll see in this period, many Chosen scholars were happy to acknowledge that it wasn't a part of Korea. It was Chinese. And of course, there are various reasons for this and various debates about it. And I'm going to fight my instinct here to give away too much. This is a slightly longer podcast, of course, simply based on the amount of content involved. And it deals with fine details, fine moments in history that when they stretch forward, have such a large impact, not just for Qing China, but for Chosun Korea and also Imperial Japan. Now, I'm going to put a link below to Nianxing's book. And I encourage listeners to go and read it for themselves. We only got to a small portion of it in this podcast. There's so much more there, so much more detail. So I do encourage you to go and follow those links below. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast directly at the Patreon link or the PayPal link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. All the help in this regard is greatly appreciated as well as any recommendations for future guests. So, on that, and to talk us through the border region between Qing China and Chosun Korea, this is Nianxing Song. Nianxing Song, thanks for coming on the Korean Hub podcast. Hi, Jet. Thank you for having me here. So today we're going to talk about, uh, I suppose, a focus for a lot of your research here. And this is the kind of research that's so deep and so detailed. So before we get into those fundamentals, I might get you to plant a flag for some of the listeners who may not have any understanding of the issue or may have a vague understanding and may not be able to follow exactly where we're going here. So as a very first question, and this may introduce your research in part here, uh, mm-hmm. Just what is the Two Min River, this this uh, demarcation between Korea and China, and what is uh, and what were Qing China and Chosun Korea, the two parties that we're going to be speaking about a lot here? Okay, uh, Two Min River is one of the uh, border rivers that separating currently uh, China uh, and North Korea. So historically, Two Min River. It's a very, you know, uh, it had a very long history uh, up until Ming Dynasty. It's already served as the boundary between China and Korea. So uh, China Korea was separated by two border rivers. One is Yalu, uh, the other is Tumen. Uh, Tumen River is a river uh, 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 originated from the Bakso Sun or in Chinese, Changban Shan, uh, flew a uh, little bit, you know, uh, uh, northeastward. 
uh, to the Sea of Japan. Uh, so it's one of the two, like I said, it's one of the two border rivers. And Qing uh, Dynasty China is the last dynasty uh, in Imperial China. It roughly lasts uh, 300 years, less than 300 years from uh, 1644 to uh, 1912 until it was overthrown by the Republic of China. And uh, Chosen Korea, of course, is the longest uh, uh, Korean dynasty uh, in the history. Um, so I guess, you know, that's my very brief uh, uh, introduction of the Tumi River and the two regimes here. Okay, so from that, let's step into uh, some of the historical background here as a way to move forward and build this up a little bit. Um, it seems to start your story, at least in part, with this dispute over the border. So let's start with the, with a um, historical background. And I suppose we should go at first to the 1870s, where it mm. seems that tens of thousands of Koreans are going across the border into what is China. And there is a dispute between the two parties over, I suppose, uh, who has the right mm. to rule these people, uh, who, and uh, I suppose there are fears on both sides of the border. Right. Um, I have to uh, uh, mention the geopolitical uh, background of, of this dispute. Uh, first of all, this is not just a two-party game. It's, you know, we the better uh, regard it as a three-party game. Because what happened in 1860 is very important, was the Qing China was forced to sign a treaty with Russia uh, to yield the uh, outer Manchuria, that is the territory uh, beyond the Usuli River all the way to the Two Men River now, to uh, SARS Russia, right? So that triggered uh, the uh, sort of first wave, wave of large Korean refugees cross the Two Men River uh, to the other side. But their initial target, you know, their, their initial destination uh, was not China, but Russia, right? Because Russia is, uh, you know, aggressively recruiting uh, agriculture immigrants to their new established frontier, nowadays uh, Russian maritime promises, uh, uh, to sort of, sort of solidify the frontier. And a lot of the uh, Korean refugees uh, went to Russia through Manchuria, through nowadays Jilin, um, and some of them stayed there. Uh, so that became a very complex diplomatic issues between Russia, uh, Qing China, and Chosun Korea. So that, that, that is the uh, uh, very brief geopolitical background. And of course, there are many domestic backgrounds as well. Uh, as we know that in the 1860s and 70s, uh, the Hankin province, Hankin Do, the northeast province of Korea, the, also the poorest uh, region in Korea, uh, suffered from severe uh, natural disasters that also pushed those poor peasants, uh, uh, you know, risk their life to, you know, violate the, the, the border ban and across the Truman River. Yeah. So that's, so that, uh, I suppose that uh, influx of refugees into, I suppose, that Chinese region there. Let's step a little bit forward, and I may be going a little bit too fast here, so do, Kat, do hold me up if I'm pushing a little bit too fast. But it I'm seems to become a much more significant question at some point when uh, Japan seems to get into the question here and the idea of Japan mapping the region itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Japan uh, entered the game, uh, well, uh, specifically entered the game of this demarcation dispute Really, just after the Russo-Japanese War, you know, when you know, you know, in in the war, the Japan realized the geostrategic uh, uh, value of the Two Men River region. So, uh, on the surface, uh, uh, in the 1910s and 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 20s, the real issues, you know, the real conflict is, you know, was between uh, China and Japan. But from the Japanese perspective, I don't think you know China was really the target here. It, again, the target, Japanese target, was Russia, right? It's the competition between uh, uh, Russia and Japan that really pushed Japan uh, to move forward to occupy this region and eventually occupy the entire Manchuria. So geopolitically, uh, that. Uh, the, the the value of the Tumen River region was really a multilateral game. You know, first between China, Japan, uh, sorry, China, Korea, and Russia. Then later between China, Japan, and Russia. 
And so this dispute, it becomes a technical legal legal issue at some point in the debate. Japan, yeah. of course, have taken over Korea. They are a protectorate at this time. And we should in introduce one of the central figures in this, one of the people who is going to become so fundamental to just how this dispute plays out and how it is resolved or not resolved. And that is a a Japanese high-ranking colonial bu uh, bureaucrat, I believe, by, I'm going to mispronounce this probably, but Shinoda uh, Jisaku. Jisaku, yes. Yeah, so pl so please introduce him and just uh, let us know exactly what he is and what his role is in all of this. Oh, uh, Shinata Jisaku uh, was a graduate from Tokyo University, you know, Tokyo Imperial University, uh, in a degree of law. So he was uh, one of the first international uh, uh, lawyer and, you know, trained in Japan. Um, so his uh, intervention in these geopolitical competitions started with the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, during the war, he served as international law expert in the Japanese army, right? And uh, after the war, when Japan started, you know, decided to intervene in the Sino-Korean uh, 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 dispute, uh, sorry, uh, 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 territory dispute, uh, he was invited to contribute his opinion from the perspective of international laws. He was the, you know, really the guy who created this uh, a definition uh, called the Taranelias or no man's land to redefine the nature of the Manchuria, uh, southern part of Manchuria. And later on, uh, because of his you know, great achievement uh, in, you know, during these uh, 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 conflict, he was later on transferred to a colonial official and dedicated his entire life in colonial Korea. He became the uh, uh, Japanese uh, officials who in charge of the internal affairs of the uh, royal family and he was you know, Korean royal family and he served as a principal of uh, the uh, imperial universities in or you know, nowadays Seoul. So it was the predecessor of the National Seoul University. So uh, he was really an interesting figure uh, in the way that you know we can clearly see how the new discourse or new knowledge of international law served the colonial enterprise. Um, and uh, he personally really, uh, um, I, you know, we can identify him as. A very interesting figure that demonstrate this kind of uh, association between colonial knowledge and international law. So let's dig a little bit more into that question there because this is so fundamental here. Of course, Japan have taken over Korea. Of course, they claim, and this is importantly, they don't just take it over. They say it's a protectorate, which again is a legal definition. So they're trying to walk a legal line here. And of course, mm. they also want control of Manchuria, I believe. And that is one of the concerns here. They they want the Korea's territory to extend further into what is supposed China and perhaps Russia. So uh, that is an old, I suppose we should, we should open up that question of Japan's desire to make the whole question uh, a part of international law, something uh, I, I suppose what you've written here, you, 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 you wrote Japan wanted to ensure that every step of it of its expansion looked and I quote civilized. And so let's mm -hmm. jump into that issue. And why was this so important for Japan? So we have to really understand these uh, uh, the Japanese ambitions and this action in the context of the rise of international law in the broader context, right? In the in the in the nineteenth century uh, 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 world context. So uh, the regime of international law really became a, a, a dominant discourse in defining uh, nations and state and international relations, starting from the late nineteenth century along with the European colonization of the world, right? So, uh, for example, you mentioned the term protectorate. That term was really invented in uh, the 1880s to define the Belgian Congo, right, in a very different geopolitical context. And Japan uh, soon uh, learned uh, from the European, its European peers that this is a new regime and this is new knowledge, and Japan learned it very fast. Uh, during the... Uh, uh, Meiji Restoration, and later uh, in the World War II, Japan formed a, a very close ally with Britain, 
and later America. So uh, Japan want to portray itself as a part of this international community, a good member of this international community. So international law really provides Japan a very useful tool to redefine not only itself, uh, but also its relation with the war, right? So this is this is happening not only in Japan, but also in in other kind uh, other Asian countries, including uh, China and, and and Korea. So uh, the Japanese uh, uh, you know lawyers and the law expert was very keen about you know these new regimes of international law. So uh, they they want to portray themselves as a very loyal uh, kind of member of this new community. And became a part of these uh, regime. So that's that's anyway that that's my uh, understanding of the Japanese uh, uh, ambitions. So uh, of course colonization needs to be justified, and it's not just you know not just justified by its power, by the physical power, but also power of knowledge, the power of discourse. So uh, Japan uh, made good use uh, of this kind of new knowledge and new power. So let's uh, make another step then. And you already mentioned the terminology once, so I suppose it's, it's, it's already there in people's minds. So let's reintroduce it. And that is the idea that uh, to claim this part, this this particular part of land as part of China, he uh, sorry, as mm. part of Chosun Korea, he begins mm. to uh, use words such as, uh, and it's not all his language. He does take some of this from historical documents, I believe, or I'm not sure if he creates all himself, but he talks about an mm. unused wasteland, a neutral area, an area be beyond right. civilization. And this is that terra nullius term that you brought in earlier. So let's, let's, let's expand that out. Why is it so important? Important that this particular type of language is used in regard to Manchuria, because during the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, not only Manchuria but all you know lands on the globe experience a you know per profound redefinition. That you know they need to be redefined in accordance with the new uh, uh, knowledge system of international law. So. Uh, before we, when we talk about land, the land is just you know uh, you know uh, agrarian land, right? Cultivated land, land that could be taxable. But in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, that definition is no longer uh, you know uh, available. You know, uh, no longer uh, can justify the ownership of the land. Land have to, have to be defined as a territory, and a territory means not just you know, someone's property, but, you know, the territory is under the jurisdiction of an internationally recognized government institution. So uh, th here comes, you know, several questions, you know, number one, who can account for an internationally recognized government entity? It's not you know, all the other Aboriginal people, for example, you know, native peoples in North America, in Australia. I was deprived of the right to be recognized as governmental entity, governmental institutions, and they are not recognized as a member of the international community. So if they were not entitled to their land, then we we need to have you know a new definition of the land. Although the you know native people live in this land, have you know lived in this land for centuries, over you know not many, many generations. Uh, so how to redefine this land? Then, you know, the term uh, terra nullius or no man's land was created to define, you know, try to redefine the land as a space that no one claimed the ownership or no one that is not belongs to the part of the community of international can lay claim to this land. So that's very important for these uh, particular Japanese experts to provide this kind of uh, justification uh, to the Japanese colonization of Manchuria because if we can define Manchuria as a place that no one ever claimed you know, ter territorial uh, 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 rights, that is the land is not a uh, sovereign, uh, you know, controlled by any sovereignty, then uh, by that logic, who claimed this land first, who cultivated this land first, can lay the claim. So the logic was that, you know, she, he, he doesn't want to, you know, jump in to say that this land belongs to Korea. But 
he tried to sort of, you know, use the new ideas to define this land as a no man's land. Then, since the land was first cultivated by the uh, uh, Korean people, and since Korean people are now uh, Japanese subject, then it comes to logic like that Japan can lay claim to this territory. So, so it's a very complex logic here. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, from that, let's uh, dig into a little, a little bit of the history of the border. And because you write here, and this is an important thing to recognize throughout this whole dispute here, you, you say that the current Sino-Korean border that formed by the Yalu and the Tumen rivers is arguably one of the oldest borders in the world that is still effective. So in some ways, right. there is a history here. So let's jump in. Let's dig back a little bit into some of the the deeper history between Chosun Korea and uh, Qing, uh, Qing China, and build mm. this out a little bit. So, uh, mm. th so there had there were two invasions into mm -hmm. Chosun Korea that I understand. So what right. exactly what was was happening with those two invasions? Because this is going to become important when we talk about mapping out the area and building uh, cartography. Right. And this is a very good question. So, um, Qing Dynasty was found by uh, before they adopted the name Manchu, uh, they will call themselves Jurchens. Um, so in Ming Dynasty, uh, Manchuria was the, uh, um, the place that multiple, uh, Jurchen, uh, 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 states or Jurchen, uh, 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 polities competed with each other. So, uh, at, not until in the early 17th century when Nurhasi, uh, unified the Georgian tribes and allied with some of the Mongol tribes that, uh, for the first time, the, uh, Georgian people established, uh, its own regime, uh, first of all called Ho Jin or later Jin dynasty, uh, in 1660s. Uh, so Nurhaci and his son Hong Taiji uh, established a new regime uh, in order to rebel against the Ming Dynasty China, and they have very uh, very clear uh, you know strategic concerns. One is the Mongol tribes in their uh, west. The other is of course Chosun Korea, uh, who uh, was the most loyal Ming tributary states uh, that located in their south. So, um, what the, uh, Nurhasi and Hong Taiji, uh, uh, strategy was to eliminate their, uh, uh, hostile neighbors first. So they, uh, keep expanding westward, uh, and allied with more and more Mongol tribes. And at the same time, they want to break the so-called, you know, the, these, these military allies between Chosun Korea and the Ming dynasty. And that is why twice the, the uh, uh, Jurchen regimes and later, you know, Manchu regime invade Chosun Korea. So for the first time, they sort of uh, established uh, like brotherhood relations with Korea. And this is a revolutionary because before uh, the Chosun dynasty also regarded Jurchen people as, a, a, you know, inferior uh, political units, right? Uh, some of the Jurchen tribe used to pay tribute to the Chosun dynasty, so they, they, they are not on an equal force. But by the first invasion, the two regimes established a sort of equal kind of relations with each other. And then the second regime in 16, a uh, second invasion in 1636. By then, uh, Hong Taiji already claimed himself as the emperor, uh, of uh, China and also the, uh, great Khan of the Mongols. So uh, he made that claim and uh, used the excuse that the chosen invoice uh, refused to call uh, in, uh, in in the ceremony. He launched his second invasion to chosen Korea in 1636. And with that invasion, the two regime uh, established a hierarchical relationship. This time that the, you know, the Manchu regime forced the chosen dynasty to acknowledge his superiority. So Chosen need to pay tribute to not on, not the Ming China, but the Manchu Qing, right? So they have to cut off any relations with Ming China. So that is the uh, sort of uh, prelude of the Manchu invasion and conquest of entire China. So from that, let's make another step forward here. And uh, when, mm. let's, so uh, for a number of years, it appears that uh, Emperor Kangji is trying to map 
this region. Mm. So he's sent several survey teams to Manchuria. It seems to be an obsession of some sorts to map the area out. And then there mm. is, in 1710, a criminal case, which is a murder case where uh, a number of uh, Koreans trespass across the, the Yalu in search of ginseng, and there's a murder case. And this, mm. it seems, is the impetus. It gives suddenly the Qing the, op the, op the opportunity to go in there and map in much greater detail. And this mm. is where we should, I suppose, introduce this Manchu official who's going to be so central to all of this. Again, I'm going right. to the, butcher the pronunciation, but uh, uh, Mukden, I believe. Yes, yes, Mukden, yeah. Mm. So, um, again, you know, we, we have to understand the geopolitical context of, of this uh, geographic survey. So, you know, Kangxi survey is well understood in, uh, in a lot of Qing studies, uh, 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 by, by the Qing scholar studies and uh, uh, some of the, you know, uh, historical geographers. Um, but we need to understand this is also related to the Russian expansion <laughs> uh, in Siberia mm -hmm. and uh, outer Manchuria. This, this again, a response uh, to the uh, Qing-Russian uh, conflict over Manchuria. Uh, so in 1698, the two parties uh, settled their dispute with a treaty, uh, the Treaty of Nijinsk. Um, at that point, the, the uh, Qing Emperor Kangxi realized how poorly, uh, you know, um, the Qing uh, regime understood uh, their own homeland, Manchuria. So he sent out some French Jesuits uh, to map Manchuria. And oh, uh, by the way, he also realized how important an accurate uh, military map uh, uh, is, is uh, during the military conflict. So uh, he was obsessed with the uh, cutting edge European cartographic technique. So he sent these uh, uh, missionaries to map uh, Beijing first, and then you know uh, uh, Chengdu, and then finally Manchuria, and eventually that geographic survey expanded to the entire Qing Empire. So uh, the 1710s criminal cases really provide an excuse uh, for Emperor Kangxi to uh, further investigate and survey the uh, uh, joint frontier, the buffer uh, uh, area between his empire and uh, the most uh, intimate uh, uh, tributary state of the Qing Empire, which is Chaozhen, Korea. So I, I really regard this as, a, as an excuse, it's, you know, because uh, Qing uh, Emperor Kangxi said, you know, it was because the border was not clear enough. That's why, you know, the criminal happened. But he knew it was not the case, right? <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the Yellow River was very clear. And it was not under any kind of uh, uh, ambiguity. It was really the uh, Pakto San region, the Changbaishan region, which the two boundary river originated. That part was not very clear. That part had some ambiguity. Uh, so he used the uh, criminal case as an, as an excuse to send uh, the official, Manchu official called Mukadun, to survey that region. And the first attempt uh, in 1711 was not so successful. Uh, due to the you know, sabotage of the, the, the Korean officials. Uh, but eventually, Mokden surveyed the region in 1712 and established, a, 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 you know, it erected a stele in this uh, no, uh, southeast part of the summit. Uh, that really, you know, became the source of all the territorial dispute and boundary dispute uh, 170 years later. So that's a great flag post to plant here because this is, is going to be so important for the rest of the interview as well. That steely that is planted yeah. there by him. Mm -hmm. But I, as you're speaking there, the one thing that was pinging in my ear, and you've written about it throughout your research here, is just how Cho Sun Korea reacted to this request to come and survey mm -hmm. their land. Because as we mentioned before, they'd already been invaded twice through this region. So I assume mm -hmm. that they must have sought this as more of a threat. As once you begin, you, if, if you've invaded a twice and you come in and you want to now survey the area in much greater detail, they must have assumed that some of this perhaps was plans for another invasion. Exactly. That was exactly how the, the Korean court, uh, regard, you know, uh, view this. So the geographic survey not, did not start in the 1710s, right? It started uh, long before that. So the Qing sent several uh, uh, investigators uh, to, you know, uh, uh, 
examine these regions. And each time, uh, when they uh, uh, send uh, a decree to chosen Korea requesting some kind of uh, uh, cooperation, uh, there was you know intense discussion among the uh, chosen kings and, and his ministers. And the consensus was that, well, this is not really a geographic survey, right? The Qing was really preparing for a retreat because, you know, they, they, they were messed up by, the, you know, the three feudal uh, rebellions and, you know, this military conflict within China. And the uh, chosen uh, 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 king and the ministers firmly believe that those Manchu barbarians cannot hold up China for long. So it was just a time, you know, just a matter of time for them to retreat to their homeland, which is Manchuria. So when the you know Qing Emperor sent those surveyors to uh, to 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 the border region in the 1680s, 19th and 1710s uh, and 1712, um, the message was repeatedly distorted, you know, uh, uh, distorted uh, by the chosen court as a preparation for the retreat. So, so they, <laughs> what what they really concerned was that how I'm gonna protect our interests, right? Uh, by that time, uh, the uh, Korean also uh, tried to expand it more t- and get more, uh, you know, uh, land, uh, not only from the mid and lower stream of the Tumen River, but the upper stream, which is you know, uh, um, you know, around the Baktosan region, and they they were so afraid that the Qing surveyors will discover. That you know uh, the the kind of you know, sort of you know secret uh, occupation of these lands. So they would try their best uh, to conceive these kind of secret action for you know to to the Qing, and that's why you know they 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 proactively let the Qing service to survey uh, the Pakistan region and and you know le- you know let him to believe that the, both the two. Rivers actually originated from the Heaven Lake, uh, Chongqi, right? Uh, the 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 uh, Crave Lake on the summit, and uh, that also leads to the many kind of uh, geographic misunderstanding uh, uh, of the origin of this river. Because you know later on we we find out that uh, both Tumen and Yellow River had multiple origins, right? Especially in this high mountain region, it's very hard to define an authentic solo origin of the river. But you know, the Korean, you know, because of these geo- geopolitical concerns, led the Qing surveyors to believe that, well, this is the authentic origin of the river. You'd better, you know, define this as the origin of our border, right? So this is a very interesting kind of. Um, misunderstanding and misdialogue between the Qing and the Chosun regimes. So on that same topic there, I suppose at least close to it, a very interesting thing happens after that survey is done. You write that uh, in large part because the border was such a settled thing, at least the the Yalu part, uh, in Qing Mm. China after the survey is done, it's largely forgotten. And you write at some point, in fact, you believe that it it may have actually, this survey may have actually been lost in a fire. But in mm. Chosun, Korea, across the border, it is remembered. It's just remembered poorly, and uh, you 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 write it's 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 widely it's widely remembered. But you write, however, the Korean knowledge with respect to the border was rather incoherent, and this comes about translation. The two two different mm. terms for the same river, two men, or perhaps the same river, two men, and on the Korean side, mm. there is a interpretation that these are two different two men rivers. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so again, the knowledge context of this, you know, uh, because of these uh, g- um, uh, kind of new geographic and geopolitical knowledge that available through the new uh, cartographic technique brought by the European justice that in East Asia, not only in China, but also in Korea and Japan, there was a enthusiastic uh, sort of uh, pursuit of this New understanding of national territory, or you know, if we you know uh, try not to use the you know very problematic term of national, then the state territory. So there was a you know a, a wave uh, in Korea uh, to get a new understanding of our territory, our land, and through that to get a new interpretation of our history. So 
uh, the uh, a new kind of geographic school and geogra- uh, you know, uh, uh, the historical school emerged in the late Chosun period, uh, trying uh, to you know, create a new identity of Korea. What does it mean for Koreans to be a Korea? What does it mean the Chosun dynasty mean an independent uh, uh, civilization, right? At least uh, uh, equal to, if not superior to, the Qing China. So all these kind of uh, uh, um, new kind of anxiety of identity came along with uh, this uh, 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 rise of Manchu and the Manchu conquest of China, and also uh, brought by the new uh, uh, available uh, technologies uh, to the, the new schools. So these are the backgrounds. And uh, through the 19, uh, 1712 uh, uh, survey, uh, the new group of intellectuals, uh, uh, Confucian literates in Korea, start to rethink about uh, their country, their territory, and their history. So there's a you know new interpretation about our land and our history. So before Korean was uh, uh, clearly knew that you know the territory be, you know only uh, defined by the peninsula itself. But later on, uh, uh, new scholars start to th- argue that, well, uh, let's think about the Kokoro dynasty, or even more the Kokoro dynasty, right? The Kokoro was, uh, you know, a, a fairly powerful regime that once controlled not only uh, northern part of peninsula, but also southern part of a large part of Manchuria. So if we trade that back, then, you know, our territory was not really confined by the uh, uh, the peninsula that that the continent is really the origin of our culture, our of our identity. So there was a new group of you know uh, uh, scholars start to rethink uh, about Korean history, and along with that, they start to interpret the geographic boundary of their territory. And it was you know uh, be, at that moment the. A uh, king of Korea, the Injo king, also promoted this idea that Patosan was our land, was our mountain, it was the royal ancestral mountain, that really encouraged uh, the the intellectuals to sort of argue about the further north land that belong used to be once belongs to to our country, and that uh, I think directly links to the confusion of the two border issue, you know, two river issue. So whether the Tumen is indeed our boundary, or is there a northern, further north river called also Tumen that was our boundary, or you know neither of them was our boundary. It was the demarcation river was boundary. So when when I checked the uh, uh, 17, uh, 18 and nineteenth century Korean maps, especially local map, I found multiple interpretation of this boundary, or use the Mukden city as the coordinator, but. The interpretation was drastically different. So, uh, drastically different. So, uh, this is a very interesting part uh, when you really look into the uh, document and and uh, uh, maps in details and to examine how uh, the Korean uh, formed their new kind of sense of territory in the 18th and 19th century. So, from that detail, let's move back a little bit into the original argument that we touched on, that uh, uh, Shinoda's argument, his legal claim here. And mm. one of the important things, so of course we've mentioned already the idea of no man's land, terra nullius, and he gets some mm. of this, at least in part it seems, from, as you mentioned before, uh, these uh, the maps of Jesuit missionaries. Now this is an important part mm. of this. So uh, Dual Haider himself never visits China, but he does compose work on it and drawings, which he bases mm. on another person's work, uh, John Baptiste mm. Regis. And Regis. Uh, yeah, Regis, sorry. And this is one of those important moments here because Shinoda takes this work and as mm. you write, takes it out of its original context. And you write deliberately takes it out of its out of its original context. To help him mm. form his argument about his argument about Terra mm. uh, I suspect that Shinoda didn't really discover the material by himself because before him, a uh, very famous uh, sinologist, uh, Naito Conan, uh, or uh, by that name he was known for his uh, end name, uh, for his original name, Naito Tolajilo, uh, who uh, talked about the Jesuit materials. 
in his report summit to the Japanese foreign ministry. Um, so he mentioned that uh, the Jesuits in the document mentioned there was uh, uh, uninhabited land uh, in between uh, Qing China and the chosen Korea. So Shinoda only take that part uh, uh, from the original text. So he interpreted it uh, as an evidence to prove there was a no man's land uh, between Qing China and the chosen Korea. So, like like you you, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, in my article, I found that this is not only a deliberate kind of distortion of original text because the the Jesuits uh, frankly claim that they had no concrete ideas about this frontier. They have never visited uh, chosen Korea. They basically base on their knowledge on a map that provided by the Tosun court and later on you know uh, you know uh, we discovered that even that map was distorted <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it, uh, the Tosun court tried to fool the book and provide a wrong map uh, so that that was you know really a chain of knowledge to show us the kind of you know the the, the circulation of knowledge uh, between uh, East Asia and West Europe and how that knowledge was adopted uh, under certain kind of political purpose by a colonist uh, agencies in the tw early 20th century uh, context. So Shinoda Jisaku used the Jesuit uh, uh, documents uh, as a supporting evidence to uh, argue for his international law definition of these disputed land. But you know, neither the Jesuits nor uh, the original uh, uh, you know, Korean uh, ministers uh, have any ideas about you know their their knowledge their information will be interpreted in this way. So this I think is is an uh, interesting thing uh, to to talk about. So before we get on to talking about Mount Pektu, Pektu San in a lot more detail, and of course, a lot of that is going to cross-reference with a lot of the stuff we've already mentioned there, and perhaps fill in some of the gaps that I breezed over there. There is an important mm. moment in this that I didn't realize until reading through your work here, and that is, so we talk about this steel that Mukaden put up as the, as the demarcation here that uh, has lasted mm. for so long. And you write an, an important and a very interesting fact here that we can't really pass over. You write, in July uh, 1931, this steel mm. suddenly went missing. So what do you make mm. of that particular moment? Because it wasn't that some, it, based on the fact that it was replaced with a wooden marker that also mm -hmm. had marks, it, it, it clearly couldn't have been some people casually stealing it for parts or something. This is a, this is a, a, a planned uh, room. Rem removal of the steel. So what do you make of that particular moment and what was it about? Uh, we don't have a concrete evidence to prove that who steal it for what purpose. Um, but the last group, you know, like, like I mentioned in, in my book, the last group pe uh, of people who witnessed uh, this CD was a group of Japanese tourists who was accompanied by the Japanese patrol uh, uh, team. And, you know, just one night after they, you know, visit the, 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 the summit of Patakusan when they returned and they discovered the city was not there. And nobody had any knowledge about where it goes and who took it. So I, I don't try to re make a decisive conclusion about, you know, who stole it. Uh, a lot of the Chinese scholars suspect that it was, you know, done by the Japanese. Uh, but we don't know that. Because you know, uh, till today, no one had any you know, knowledge, concrete knowledge, about about the city. Uh, but the time here was important. Um, 1931, Ju June 1931. Because what happened in June is also the you know the Guan Baoshan incident. The Japanese fabricated this uh, ethnic conflict between the Chinese peasants and the Korean peasants. Uh, in a place in Jilin called Wan Baoshan, and uh, that was, you know, followed by uh, a large anti-Chinese uh, uh, kind of uh, conflict in Korea, uh, uh, which was, you know, a sort of uh, inflamed by the Japanese propaganda machine. Uh, so only one month after that, there was, you know, a Mukden incident. Um, the Japanese fabricated the uh, the uh, 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 sorry uh, the Mukden incident. Claim that you know they are you know preventing the Chinese army to make attack, and then uh, occupied the entire Manchuria. So that was you know a very critical moment 
in history. Um, so I, I, I only um, you know make that timeline clear, but I don't want to jump into you know a, a harsh conclusion that it was definitely the Japanese who did it because we don't know. So before we get into Mount Pekdu, I, I think I, something else needs to be clarified. There's so much detail in your work here that I'm breezing <laughs> over too quickly. I'm very conscious not to leave too much out. But there is one thing you write about an awful lot in detail, and it's really there in a lot of what you write about. But uh, I, we're not going to have too much time to touch on it today. But there is a lot of detail here that we should get into, at least in part, and that is the relationship between Qing China and Chosung Korea. And I suppose, mm. I suppose through a lot of we spoke about already, a lot of people would get some indication. You mentioned the idea that this was a brotherly r- relationship. So mm. let's jump into that that idea that you bring out, that many people at least have an idea that uh, of, 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 quite, of quite the opposite. So many people have this idea that it's a tributary system. And you mm. write that this is a, this shouldn't be understood in this way. This is much more of a mutual relationship be, be between the two countries or mm. between the two dynasties. Right. So I I, I prefer the, the the term of uh, Zongfan hierarchy. Um, um, so it, it indicates you know the theoretical uh, background of this term and the cultural practice of the the the, the relation. So I. Uh, the tributary system, you know, the, the problem of this term tributary is, you know, this is, came from a Latin term, tribute, which implied a uh, tax uh, imposed by the Roman empires to uh, the, the uh, other foreign states. Uh, so it indicates just a unilateral kind of imposition of power. Uh, it, and it also implied uh, uh, the aspect of monetary exchange, right, as, as about, you know, uh, the tax. And uh, it's sort of uh, implied this is a fairly rigid and a kind of systematic uh, relationship. You know, I argue that you know neither of them were true, because we have to understand the the the, the true nature of the Zongfan hierarchy. Yes, it was a hierarchy, but it was not unilaterally imposed. Every party involved in this system, you know, in, in this relationship, get their benefits from it. Uh, for example, uh, the Beijing, the, you know, the son of heaven, uh, used this relationship to justify their rule uh, in China and uh, to, to, to really claim that they were the son of heaven, they were the agency of the true heaven. Whereas other uh, states, uh, Chosun or uh, uh, Vietnam, Xi'an, other, other states, also uh, uh, use this uh, uh, relationship to justify their own domestic ruling, right? So you have to get the uh, authorization from the Son of Heaven uh, to justify your own ruling to your own country. And the exchange was much more complex than uh, one way of imposition of you know, tax, right? So yes, uh, Chosun or Vietnam or Sign have to pay tribute to Beijing, uh, uh, in Chosen's case, um, three or four times a year, uh, uh, in the next case, and Liu Qiu's case, you know, once a year, and in some case, maybe ten, ten, uh, ten, uh, once every 10 years. But that was a mutual kind of exchange because you get the return of the gifts from Beijing. So it was not really uh, an a, a, a equal trade. And other than the uh, uh, this kind of political ritual, there was many, many more you know, uh, interesting activities involved in here. For example, in Chosun and, and, uh, and Vietnam and Liu Chu's case, uh, the tributary uh, 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 action was also paved the way for an official and also an official trade between China. So this is a very important channel to create this regional economic uh, 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 system. So, you know, I, in one word, I think, you know, the, the, the term tributary system needs to be rethink, rethought and have to be, uh, you know, uh, defined in a very specific way. In that way, you know, we may just, you know, get rid of this, this term and use another term like, you know, Zongfan hierarchy to better describe uh, the nature of this kind of mutual relations. So from that, let's take a step into Mount Peck II. Now, this is one of those things that many people, even if they're completely unfamiliar with a lot of topic, they probably have heard of, of Mount Peck II, if for nothing else, but from North Korean news. And this is one of those sites where you mm-hmm. always get people like Kim Jong-un posing on with white horses and things like this. But all that 
for all its uh, uh, showiness and uh, propaganda, it does speak to the place that Pek Tuzan has in Korean history. And uh, mm-hmm. so what is this mountain and uh, what is its relationship to uh, both, I suppose, China and Korea? And then after that, we'll get into some of the of the deeper details there. Well, um, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, uh, dig into too many, you know, too long history or too, you know, much details about this this mountain. You know, just just limit our conversation to Qing Dynasty, right? Qing Dynasty and Chosen Dynasty. So the Qing Emperor, especially Kangxi, uh, regard this mountain, right, in in, in Chinese term, Tang Bai Shan. Uh, as the royal ancestor mountain. So this is a part of the Qing's misconstruction, right? The, the identity construction, the identity myth of the Qing regime. So, uh, the, uh, uh, Emperor Kangxi, uh, starting from, uh, late 17th century, start to worship, uh, Chang Bai Shan, uh, Bak uh, and listed, you know, these royal ancestor mountain. As the uh, you know in the state ritual, state worship, the mountain worshiping ritual. So it was the you know kind of first wave of miscreation efforts made by a royal regime, right, which is Qing Emperor. Uh, and in the late 17th, uh, sorry, late 18th century, Chosen Korean also start to mythify these mountains. Before, right, the 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 the, the mountain was mentioned in some documents. Uh, in some historical records, but never really regarded as part of the Korean terrain. There were, it was, you know, it was a uh, progenitor of all the mountains and rivers in Korea, but the Korean was, you know, Korean Confucius is rather very cautious about listing these mountains as, you know, as, as a subject of uh, royal or state ritual ceremony. Um, so uh, after the angels, uh, you know, a period, there was, uh, you know, during the angel period, there was uh, two uh, debates in the chosen court, and the result of the, the debate was that, you know, we should regard Pak Tosan as our royal ancestor mountain, and we should start to worship Pak Tosan and list Pak Tosan as the northern holy mountain, right? So it was, you know, also happened fairly recently. And all the historical writings after the 17th century start to kind of revise in accordance with this change. So we got a new uh, school of scholars start to claim that, well, the, uh, our ancestor, the, 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 the national ancestor, Tanglin, was born in uh, this region. And that directly linked to the nationalist movement in the early 20th century. In the 20th century, uh, Pak really became a, 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 a symbol of Korean nationalist movement, Korean independent movement. So uh, anyway, from, from the uh, you know uh, uh, early 20th century, uh, Park Tosan became really the symbol of Korean independent movement and the nationalist movement. And after the you know World War II, that mountain also became a sort of holy symbol of Kim Bridgen's uh, you know fears anti you know uh, you know uh, fearless anti Japanese movement and directly linked to uh, the North Korean uh, regimes to just, you know, really, a, a, you know, a, a symbol of their uh, gracious and brave kind of uh, uh, a nationalist campaign. Uh, that's the um, sort of evolution of the symbolism of Pak Tosan. And uh, also in the 1970s, uh, during the Pak Jun He period in, in South Korea, uh, there was, uh, you know, an impulse to uh, uh, reshape the national limits, right? So move the uh, um, previously Sheila and Pakje focused history to sort of northern focus uh, history. Uh, let's talk about the glory, glory of uh, Kokoreo regimes and all, you know, those uh, narrative, of course, will pick Pak Tosan as a very important national symbol. So Pak Tosan uh, was in, you know, as you know, you must know, uh, was in the first line of the national anthem of South Korea. And so immediately it became a symbol for both North and South Korean, and also during the Qing dynasty, a symbol of uh, 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 Qing's regime. So this is a, you know, kind of a multilateral kind of uh, 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 symbolism involved in this this uh, volcano. 
So let's talk about some of that debate and some of that challenge around this mountain, because it, as as you're right, it goes from this mountain that is not commonly considered part of Korea, at least not in the official documents, and then it moves into it. So this is important. So in these uh, in these documents, you have these these uh, discussions, and you have these high ranking officials saying things like. Pekchusan is a foreign place, but it's but it is the progenitor of mountains and rivers of the state. And you're right. Mm-hmm. And there's other things like, um, uh, yes, Pekchusan is your land. Why bother to borrow it, uh, 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 our realm to pass by? So there's this recognition there that it, at least at this time, is part of Qing China. And mm-hmm. but there's and actually an open debate it seems in the Chosun court here. And mm-hmm. they all come out and they start having these debates. So. This is an interesting moment. I might get to introduce this here. And this is where they are all arguing about why it has been left outside the boundaries for so long. And there's all these debates about whether it was de- it was deliberately left out and therefore we can't uh, go back and start worshipping the mountain now because of con- Confucian documents and all mm-hmm. sorts of things such as the kings must have had a good reason for excluding it. So this, uh, I might get to take us into that deep debate inside Chosun and about how it once fell outside the boundaries and suddenly they were debating about whether or not they could bring it back in. Mm. Um, so um, again, the historical background uh, of this debate is also, you know, what is the Koreans position in regard to, you know, uh, its relations with, with Qing China? Uh, I don't have to, you know, uh, mention that that the, the Chosun king and ministers really hate the Qing China, the Manchus, and but they really uh, per- try to portray themselves as the true uh, inheritor of the civilization that is Confucius civilization. So uh, that's why there is a term called Shouzhong uh, Wall, the Little China. So Korean uh, regard themselves as uh, Something that you know more Chinese than the Chinese themselves. Uh, that's why that created tension, right? So politically uh, and officially, Korean regarded Qing as its superior uh, uh, polity. So it had to follow this Confucius doctrine that you know uh, if a mountain was uh, located in the you know uh, you know the realm uh, of uh, superior uh, uh, polities, you cannot worship it. That is that that is the Confucian doctrine, but uh, psychologically, these Korean intellectuals also regard themselves as a party not that inferior from the Qing in terms of its culture, in terms of of you know the level of civilization. So it was okay for them to say that well, uh, if Qing can worship this mountain, we can also worship the mountain. And the evidence was that you know our royal ancestors also originated from that region. Right from the Hemkindo region, so at that moment, King Yunjo also want to uh, win the debate uh, to solidify his power over the highly fragmented uh, 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 political uh, uh, parties. So we, we we know that the party politics was was a long problem in Chosun Korea, and Yunjo is the uh, king, the most ambitious king, and try to really eliminate the uh, power conflict among different fragmented parties and solidify his own power. Right? So he, he need that he need to win this debate. And uh, these kind of uh, uh, look you know the, the, the debate over people's looks like a superficial debate, look like a debate of Confucius doctrine, but it was uh, highly motivated by the power politics and power conflict. Uh, among the Korean uh, uh, kings and ministers, so there was, you know, a very complex uh, uh, historical context behind this debate. It was not just a culture debate or a ritual debate. We have to regard it as as a power debate. So let's talk about cartography again. And of course, a lot of what we have been speaking about when it comes to the Tumin River will overlap with a lot of the maps and the history, of course, of what we've been speaking about now. Um, and of course, uh, mm-hmm. there is a movement in Korea at this time, the Silhak movement or the or the practical learning movement. And this, uh, yeah. co- this of course, meshes in nicely with this new movement from the Jesuit to, towards Jesuit cartography and this idea of improved yeah. geography and mapping. 
And what becomes important for Chosun Korea is uh, the mapping out, or at least the the in the insistence that the establishment of six garrisons along the Tumen River was a, a mm. some sort of a recovery or a demarcation of Korean land. And this is something that I believe King Sejong did in 1433. So what were those six garrisons and why were they so important when it came to cartography and building a map of, Cho, of Chosun Korea? Well, the short answer was that th that was the uh, limits of Chosun territory uh, uh, on the north in the north, right? Chosun. Well, we know that Korean is a peninsula, so uh, everything but the northern frontier that was very very clear. You you just follow the coastline. So in in terms of map making, uh, it you know it, it doesn't create a difficulty. Uh, to realize, you know, what the uh, limits of 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 your rule uh, was, right? That that was the coastline. Only the northern frontier, right? That was the connection. Uh, that that was the only channel for the uh, uh, peninsula to the uh, Asian continent. So, uh, of course, the uh, an, any uh, uh, ambitious king uh, or generals will pay much attention of the northern frontier and the northern border. So uh, Sejong uh, take advantage of the uh, vacancy of the power in uh, the 15th century, uh, expanded to the mid and lower Tumen River stream and established the so-called six garrisons. Uh, and later on, uh, he expanded furthermore to the upper stream uh, of the, not, not Sejong himself, but later kings uh, expanded furthermore to the upper stream of the Tumu River all the way to the Chosun region and established another, uh, uh, the last garrison, which is Mosa, Musa, uh, in the, uh, I, I believe it's 1687 uh, or 1670, something like that. Um, so that was the most important strategic point uh, of the uh, uh, Chosen Korea. That was where the anime came from. That was also where you know the civilization came from. That was the only uh, one of the only channels that Korea connected with outside world. While the other being the, um, um, you know, the uh, Japan through the Sapphire Islands. So um, in many many Korean maps, especially in the late Chosen period, the shape of the territory was. Uh, more and more leans towards a, a perfect shape of a golden cup. Um, and the Paktosan and six garrisons, Paktosan, uh, the two border rivers and the garrison along that rivers became really the coordinator of the Korean geography. So a lot of, you know, the, uh, uh, uh map making used Paktosan as really the landmark to indicate the northmost point that the Cho chosen or Korean civilization extended to. And beyond that, that was just, you know, the Georgian people, the barbarians land, that was, you know, wild land, but within it, that was our civilization. So I, I think, you know, in this sense, the uh, Pakistan was not only important for the, you know, uh, geopolitical sense in Korean, but also uh, very important to create a sense of Koreanness. Uh, in the late chosen period. So that's a very interesting point that this idea of uh, the phrase you use in your work here is quite apt, I suppose, uh, territorial consciousness. And that is the idea that Koreans suddenly find themselves Korean. They have this territory. And mm. before we uh, round off on some questions, I suppose we should introduce these these two maps composed by uh, Chosun uh, scholars, I suppose, at the time, uh, Chong Sang-gi and, King, and uh, Kim Chong-ho. And they mm. and their use of new techniques. Uh, uh, Chong Sang Gi uses an odometer for for the, for the first time and a scale mm. system. And uh, uh, Kim Chong Ho uses uh, yeah a greater scale system. So I might get you to introduce that uh, and and just how important the maps made by these two scholars were and uh, just how uh, as 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 you write how they galvanized this territorial consciousness of everyday Koreans. Um. 
again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Korean get new uh, cartography techniques from Qing China, right? The Qing China also get you know get it from the Jesuits. So uh, through the Qing invoice to to Korean, the Korean uh, technicians, the map makers, uh, for the first time realized you know there was a new technique, you know longitude and latitudes that can you know highly uh, 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 kind of enhance the accuracies of of map. Uh, so Chung Sung Gi, you know, map makers like Chung Sung Gi adopt this uh, quantified methods and really create a new kind of understanding of Korean shape. And it was really Kim Jong Ho himself uh, in the 19th century pushed the traditional Korean cartographer to uh, a high level, very high level. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, he he made this uh, uh, the map of the Great East and circulate uh, this map. That was the peak of not only the Korean cartography, I would say the entire uh, traditional East Asia cartography. That was really a brilliant work. And um, he used the uh, uh, technique brought by Mukden, uh the triangular, uh, well, so, sorry, the, uh, the mathematic uh, methods. Uh, not only that, he used the uh, measurements of, uh, of the uh, technicians, uh, you know, went Along with Mukden, uh, to Chosun Korean, the technicians measured the longitude and latitudes of the capital city of Chosun Dynasty, the, the nowadays Seoul. And Kim Jong Ho used the uh, uh, cap- the longitude and latitudes of this capital city and measured the distance between Seoul and other cities, other provinces, uh, and used that you know uh, uh, technology, used that methods to measure the coastline and borderlands of Korea. So, so the coordinator changed from Pakdusan to the capital, and he used uh, mathematic methods to make a very accurate um, uh, uh, map of Korea. It really revolutionized the Korean understanding uh, of their land. So that's that's how important uh, the you know the the spread of knowledge, uh, especially the spread of cartographic knowledge, uh, was in late Joseon period. And yet there is a very important uh, moment, a very important marker on his map there. So despite mm. the accuracy and the scientific uh, detail in these new maps. You write that um, the Mukden steel is still portrayed <laughs> large; it is completely outsized on the map. And you write yeah. that this is a consistent effort to make history visible in the construct of this space. So uh, <laughs> let's just so I might get explained just what you mean there. Why it's so <clears throat> important that despite uh, this new scientific thing taken over, this scientific moment taken over in this new scientific map. They still go back and build this one particular part of 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 history up and make it, uh, I suppose, outlarged on the map. Yeah, precisely because the ideas of territory uh, or our land in late Joseon period was not just a geographic thing; it's very much a historical thing. So you can justify your territory not only uh, by or not narrowly. Uh, by geography, but you have to justify your land by history. That's why I believe uh, the Mokden city was still very important uh, here to define the northern border because the city supposedly uh, defined our northmost territory. Uh, uh, so any Korean map uh, have to clearly, uh, you know, uh, start its depiction of northern frontier from this point, from the Mokden city. So that's why. I think it's quite interesting. So, though, even in a very scientific map, the history still played a very critical role in the map making. Not merely a geographic war, but also a historical war. So, as a final question here, and uh, this is an interesting way to try and tie this all together, uh, we mentioned, of course, at the very start when we started talking about uh, Pektusan, that it has now become this nationalistic symbol for both South and North Korea. But importantly, mm. here in your writings, you write that uh, 
the efforts to bring Pectusan into Korea and this map building around it were not uh, done with a nationalistic impulse. You're right. It was it it rather it reflected Korea's profound concerns regarding its new relationship with China, a concern mm. mixed with geopolitical tension and cultural anxiety. So that is. A, a wonderful way to try and tie us together. I might yet to take us there by exactly what you mean. This, uh, this, because there's a, I suppose there's a sense that when you look back, that there must have been a nationalistic impulse as there is today. But it seems mm. to be a much more practical concern about the emergence of the nation state in the world, the importance of right. geopolitical landscapes and populations, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, that that is a, a you know a brilliant question. Uh, let me think about you know how, how to respond to that. Um, I try to write about uh, these demarcation and uh, you know a dispute over Korean immigrants and the territory, not from the perspective of any individual state. So um, I don't think my book is a study of you know Korea or just study of China or Japan. I studied a local region, uh, which happened to be. Uh, a multilateral frontier and happen to be the a place that multiple political forces overlap here. And the Pakistan and Tumen River region was exactly that kind of space that witnessed not only the evolution of the new technology, new knowledge, uh, but also the new understanding of land and people and witnessed the evolution from a traditional kind of, kind of imperial state to a, you know, quote unquote. Nation state, and I want to, you know, uh, really discover what is the relations between these um, supposedly two different states. I, th I think you know they, they are much more similar than uh, than their differences. Um, have more similar narratives than their differences. Um, so uh, regarding the national identity and nationalism, I I think you know when we talk about nationalism, it's never really just about yourself. It's always uh, to regard itself. Uh, in a relationship with the other, right? So, Park Tosan and uh, and uh, 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 especially you know the the picket of Park the uh, the Craven Lake on it became a national symbol not only because Korean try to find their own identity. That anxiety always came from is anxiety towards its geopolitical enemies, right? Uh, particularly uh, in the 20th century, Japan was the colonizer of Korean. So Korean tried to define a Koreanness that differs from Japan uh, politically. But how to justify the independence of a lineage, linear history that you know our na nation has always been an independent? You know, it's, it has its own history that different from the Chinese history or Japanese history. The Korean must find a culture enemy, uh, in, in, in my words, uh, to have this kind of uh, sense of selfness. And that quote unquote enemy happens to be China because for a long time, Korea was uh, sort of regarded as a tributary state or you know inferior state of China. Not only uh, the Korean uh, Lin Lacros regarded their relations to China in this way, but also the you know historical writers uh, uh, especially in the Chosen Dynasty, they follow the, the Confucius doctrine and portray themselves as a loyal kind of tributary uh, members of the Son of Heaven. So in the 20th century, the nationalist movement very much targeted at both the Japanese aggression uh, physically uh, and, and, and politically, and also the uh, and, and uh, you know the vision of you know this Chinese empire, this Chinese aggression, uh, aggressive culture. So th that is why uh, Patrusan became such important and a very interesting symbol for both Koreans because that indicates the everlasting independence of Korea. So uh, Tangun started with Korean and Kokoryo uh, started uh, sorry st uh, started with Patrusan and Kokoryo controlled the Patrusan and our country. I was really, uh, you know, uh, regard Dr. Sun as our holy motherland, the fatherland. So, um, in, in, in this case, I, I, I think, you know, when we talk about nationalism, it's never really a Korean thing, right? So, uh, uh, the, the, the local history, uh, really is a demonstration of nationalism, uh, emerging in all surrounding countries. It's, you know, it happened also, it re also related to, 
uh, the national consciousness in in China, and it's also uh, uh, regarding the Japanese colonial identity, uh, you know, in Japan. So it was uh, simultaneously stimulate the nationalist thing in all the three East Asian countries. Uh, so that's how I understand uh, the, the the intriguing uh, feature of the symbol of nationalism. Now that's a, a great note to leave it on, a wonderful summation there. Um, so the articles that I've personally used for research for this podcast, I'm going to link below. So I do encourage people to go and read them. Uh, literally, I had a hand, a complete bucket full of these things, and I could only touch a couple of questions. So I, I, there is so much more detail there. But a lot of this is also available in your book. So I might get you to very briefly just introduce that before we end this off. So uh, what are the title of your book and uh, just uh, what the details are. So people who are interested in the podcast, who want to read more and want to go beyond the articles what is just to get them to introduce your book here and uh, just exactly what it is and uh, where they can find it oh okay sure thank you so much uh, so the title of this book is making borders in modern east asia uh, the truman river demarcations 1881 to 1919 uh, it was published by uh, cambridge university press in 2018 and uh, um, uh, last year in december it had a Paperback, so it's fairly you know, affordable now. <laughs> then it's uh, a hardback. Uh, so basically, uh, the the book talks about uh, the um, dispute uh, 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 around the Korean refugees in South Manchuria, in nowadays Yanbian Korean ethnic uh, autonomous region in in Jilin Province, China. Uh, along with the dispute of uh, population uh, came the dispute of territory. So uh, where is the border, true border between uh, Manchuria and Korea? And that involves not only China and Korea, but also Japan and to some extent Russia. So I use um, um, these uh, border uh, uh, as a method, the demarcation as a method to investigate the overall transition uh, from the late 19th century to early 20th century in East Asia. Now, and I argue that these demarcations was not really just a, a, a clear definition of, of land and people, but also involving the you know grand political transition happened not only in China, but also in Korea and in Japan. So I try to uh, see East Asia as an integrated whole and how it responds to uh, the theme what we call uh, modernity. And the links to that book will, of course, also be provided below in the podcast. And again, I encourage listeners to go and read it for themselves. <clears throat> on that, Nianxing uh, Song, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Oh, thank you, Jack. It's a pleasure to talk to you.